All right. Thanks everyone for joining. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon, good morning, and good evening to you all. And welcome to the seventh episode of the Space Generation Advisory Council webinar series on health in space. This episode is all about food for space. My name is Jules Lancé, and my guests of today are Christina Valakuti and Benjamin Greaves. Welcome back to our series. Of course, venturing out into deep space will give rise to new challenges, not only to the technologies being used, but also to the human element in this type of journey. Our bodies and minds will be put to the test when we travel to Mars on a three year return journey, or even in the next human missions to the moon. And today we will talk about how to sustain that body and mind using the right nutrition. And as soon as we will go forward to the moon or even to Mars, resupply missions will become more rare and the astronauts will have to have to take care of for themselves, including for their food supply. Current astronaut crews on board the International Space Station have a limited choice of diet restricted to food that is stabilized for long duration, preserved by dehydration. And these food items are optimized for their physical health, but psychological aspects of food might be just as important. For example, astronauts have reported to greatly appreciate the cargo ships arriving every now and then with fresh fruits on board. In deep space, this proves way more challenging. Will those astronauts grow their own fruits or will they be limited to potatoes like Matt Damon in The Martian? And what developments in technologies can we expect? How is the diversity of our terrestrial diets linked to what we can do in zero gravity? It's a topic of great interest to scientists, and we invited two of them for our episode today. Two great speakers that I will introduce now. And then after their introduction, I have a little housekeeping announcement. And before we finally, we'll start with their presentations. So first, we'll hear from Christina Ariadne Valakuti. She computed, completed a Bachelor of Science in Nutrition and Dietetic Science from Harakopio University of Athens, and is now enrolled in Wageningen University and Research in the second year of her master's specialization on molecular nutrition and toxicology. Her vision of an effective space health system led her to the creation of the Space Medicine and Life Science Space Nutrition subgroup, of which you see the Twitter handle uh, in the screen uh, below, that aims to offer learning opportunities and inspiration to nutrition scientists and to demonstrate the potential of nutrition science to mitigate common health issues of not only astronauts, but also the general population. After Christina, we will hear from Benjamin Greaves. Ben attended the University of Michigan and received a bachelor's in mechanical engineering and a master's in space engineering. However, in recent years, through volunteering at local food pantries, interning at NASA to work on their advanced food production, and serving as a US Peace Corps agricultural volunteer in the Gambia, the importance of food security and food equity has become his passion. Now with Orbital Farm, Ben is developing off-earth plant growth technologies and working towards food accessibility here on Earth. Um, we'll get you to Christina and Ben shortly, but first a few housekeeping items. You have been muted upon entry to avoid background noise and disruptions. This session will be recorded for later viewing. And this webinar, as it is a feat of engineering, is not comparable to anything being accomplished in space. However, this is still a global effort with your speakers and moderator being in two or maybe three different time zones already today, not counting you, the audience. And of course, we are not counting on any disruptions, but Murphy's Law does apply. So in that case, please bear with us as we try to restore the live session as quickly as possible. And finally, Feel free to use the chat box during the presentation for questions and comments. During the Q&A part at the end of this session, I will ask your questions to our speakers. Um, now, I have been talking a lot, so let's get to our first speaker, Christina Valakuti. Hi, Christina. Thanks so much for being with us today. Um, I'll be switching Hi, over to you, you, if you don't mind to share your screen. Yes, of course. Um, I really appreciate you uh, you becoming a part of this, and I'm very much so looking forward to hearing about your research in this field. So the virtual floor is yours. 
Thank you very much um, for the introduction and thank you everyone for joining. Um, so be before I start bombarding you with what is space nutrition, I would like to cover why space nutrition. So it is within our current understanding that the nutritional needs for the maintenance of a healthy status change with different stages of life. Think uh, pregnancy or adolescence. Uh, they change with different activity levels and they also change with certain medical conditions. So they also change when someone flies in space. Uh, the collection of factors an astronaut is exposed to is called the space exposome. And uh, it can cause significant physiological changes that can create new demands. Failing to optimize uh, new demands, um, failing to optimize nutrition according to those new demands, uh, can create health issues uh, which will be impairing performance during space flight. Plus, they're not always reversible. So, one of these factors um, is the lack of gravity. Astronauts experience weightlessness for a prolonged amount of time, which can lead to accelerated osteoporosis. Uh, this, happen, this happens basically because bones and muscles do not get signals to stay strong, um, because they're not carrying around the weight they would uh, carry if they were on Earth. So this loss accounts to 1-2% to 2 of total bone mass per month. This means nothing to you probably, but to put this into perspective, an elderly person loses the same percentage of bone mass per year. Uh, so you can imagine the impact of an ISS and expedition that um, it's very common to last about six months. 12% of the, of the entire bone mass gone in, in six months. On top of that, this condition is only partially reversible, and the current countermeasures include physical exercise. Um, however, recent, recent evidence supports the role of vitamin K in maintenance of bone and muscle. So there was a thought that maybe vitamin K might need to be incorporated in astronaut diet um, in higher amounts than the recommended ones for people on Earth to prevent this uh, bone loss effect of weightlessness. Another factor that might change nutritional needs is exposure to radiation. Astronauts venture outside Earth's atmosphere and they are exposed to cosmic rays, which can cause significant amounts of oxidative damage. Uh, basically, this translates to destruction of important molecules in our body, DNA alteration and cell death. There are nutrient compounds that can counter this oxidative damage to a degree, and they are called antioxidants. Um, so the thought derived from this information is that people exposed to cosmic rays might have increased needs in antioxidants compared to the general population. Uh, one factor that could alter nutritional needs is the lack of natural sunlight. Under normal conditions, the skin can synthesize vitamin D by exposure to sunlight, and uh, this protects us from a deficiency that would manifest as uh, bone, muscle, and tooth problems. As there is no sunlight in space, astronauts rely solely on food sources of vitamin D. Uh, so they are likely to have increased vitamin D nutritional requirements compared to the people on Earth who get exposed to sunlight more regularly. So even though it is important for astronauts to adhere to optimized nutrition, this is usually not the case. And um, astronauts um, return to Earth having lost a lot of weight. The explanation is pretty straightforward. They just don't eat enough. And ironically, this is caused by the same reason they need to stick to an optimized diet in the first place, exposure to space environment. So first of all, with a lack of gravity, uh, a lot of blood flows to the head instead of the legs, and this um, can lead to in increased pressure inside the head. Uh, this can result to a puffy face, which is very similar to having a cold, and a very common cold symptom is the loss of uh, sense of smell and taste. Uh, so this is not an exception. Uh, also, you've probably heard of motion sickness or even experienced it. It's what happens when your inner ear and your eyes are sending different signals to your brain and then you get nauseous and you might vomit. So mismatching ear and eye inputs in space uh, cause space motion sickness. So it's a type of motion sickness and uh, it can greatly reduce appetite um, as it shares the same manifestations. So if we combine all these with increased energy expenditure from exercise as a countermeasure 
to muscle atrophy, it's not a surprise that astronauts return mal malnourished to Earth. And on top of that, um, as Joel said in the introduction, there are limited menu options, which consist mostly of unfamiliar foods that are not always palatable. Uh, astronauts are having trouble maintaining a healthy relationship with food, and food is meant to be enjoyed. So astronauts lose their appetite and the portion of their weight along with it. And space food holds part of the blame. So space food items can be a really tricky business because of their requirements. Besides nutritious, space food must be first easy to prepare and consume in zero G. Uh, preparing a simple sandwich, for example, is not that easy when like everything around you is floating. You would need three hands, in fact, to prevent the first slice of bread from floating around. Um, so secondly, it needs to be packaged appropriately, so it will be both easily stored and safe for consumption even after long months of storage. Um, it's imperative to minimize cramps. In zero G, they can float away and they can get in airways. So the food is usually covered with an edible um, film that uh, can dissolve in the mouth. And lastly, it has, of course, to be tasty, um, and otherwise it just won't be eaten in uh, enough amounts. Um, yeah, so luckily the food on ISS has evolved, um, has evolved a lot uh, since the first missions, and there are plans to keep making it more and more Earth-like. So now crew members on the ISS can consume food in familiar forms instead of tubes, and there are more than 300 options to choose from. As the astronauts are from different countries, the available food is international, which can really help with the morale. And uh, the process is that the astronauts state beforehand which offer foods they like uh, the best, and the menu is created based on nutritional requirements and then reviewed. So some of these foods require the addition of water, which makes them rehydratable. Others have been heated to high temperatures prior to packing. Um, we also have irradiated foods, which is a word uh, used for food that has been exposed to some form of radiation, like uh, gamma rays, X-rays, or electron beams. And uh, this is an effective way to kill microorganisms that reside in food and cause it to spoil. There's also a fourth category, um, foods that can be consumed in a natural uh, form. Uh, and these are nuts and dried fruits. Um, they are kept uh, usually in vacuum sealed packages to remain fresh as long as possible. There are also options of commercially available food, like cereal, for example, where astronauts simply add the milk. Um, and it's, it's interesting that all commercially available food is being repacked, which might sound as inefficient, but it's preferable to use a packaging already familiar than having to test each vendor's preference um, for combustibility, for example. So the current shelf life is around 12 to 18 months, but there are goals to increase it. And um, consumption of fresh fruits and vegetables, which are the staples of a healthy diet, is way more complicated. There are resupplies to the ISS several times per year by a specialized vehicle, but this is something that's not going to be possible for a mission of deep space exploration. Uh, another issue is uh, how certain can we be that nutritional value of uh, space food is the same as their ground counterparts? So there is evidence from ground studies that uh, long-term storage and exposure to radiation can alter vitamins and fatty acids in food, um, rendering them useless at best and dangerous at worst. So this could hinder long-duration exploration missions and pose serious health hazards for the astronauts. So a study was designed uh, to determine which nutrients are maintained and which are degraded and at what rate. Alongside a multivitamin and a vitamin D supplement, five different foods were sent to the ISS. Uh, tortillas, almonds, salmon, broccoli, and apricots. After 13, 353, 596, and 880 days of space flight, packages were being returned to Earth um, for a side-by-side -side analysis with their ground count counterparts. Um, so from the results, um, samples on the ISS did not degrade faster than the ground controls. Uh, and this led the um, researchers to the conclusion that the effects observed on the nutrient stability 
are mostly due to the duration of the space flight and not so much because of the flight itself. Uh, however, it's not guaranteed that, that nutrient absorption from our bodies while in orbit is the same as it would be if we were on Earth, because the transporters in our gut that are responsible for taking up the nutrients might be suffering from radiation damage, inhibiting our capacity to uptake nutrients from food. Another thing that changes um, is the microbiome. So the microbiome is a collective name for the microorganisms that live in our gut, and they are very important for staying healthy. Uh, they relate to immunological and neurological functions, and even though we have no direct insight into which their functions precisely are, uh, we know that the more diverse they are, the better. Uh, also, astronauts, um, they suffer a lot from gastrointestinal infections, and um, it is believed that the microbiome is to blame because uh, reduced numbers of beneficial microorganisms compromise the defense against the pathogenic ones. Uh, so there are specific uh, spaceflight cues that can alter microbiome. Uh, exposure to radiation, changes in light and dark cycles, confinement, and microgravity. All of this can affect the diversity of microbiome. But there's one more factor, you guessed it, nutrition. Uh, the almost sterile meals make it very difficult for the astronauts to maintain a healthy gut microbiome. And uh, the solution might be the administration of probiotics. This is a term used um, to describe giving to someone live beneficial microorganisms, either via pills or via a food item that contains some culture of them. Yogurt, for example, is very known for its content of friendly bacteria. Uh, the best combo of microorganisms and the best delivery method are yet to be determined. And um, I suppose once we can grow fruits and vegetables in space, things will be much easier. Um, so. Um, to sum it up, space nutrition seeks to keep the physiology and the psychology of astronauts in good shape in order to achieve the sustainability of longer space exploration missions. It can go a long way when it comes to the maintenance of crew performance, so this would be my take-home message, the areas of impact. First, prevention of the nutritional deficiencies discussed and their subsequent diseases uh, is important to ensure the physical health of the crew. Second, providing appetizing meals and the preservation of food culture can aid with the mental stability of the crew. I'm sure I speak for all of us when I say that a nice tasty meal has beneficial effects on psychology and astronauts are not an exception. Uh, third, nutrition can play a very important role in the rehabilitation process of astronauts as it is a way we can offer our body everything it needs to recover. Four, um, astronauts need an adequate, reliable, and safe food supply, and as all explorers do. A nutrition scientist can help in achieving a food system su uh, suitable for deep space exploration missions. This also applies to colonization mission. Nutrition scientists can provide information and determine which foods will be the most suitable to sustain a human colony, especially on planets where food cultivation will be impossible. And lastly, Let's not forget the terrestrial application of space tech. One brilliant example is the HACCP Food Safety Management System, short for Hazard Analysis and Critical Control Forms, that is used widely by food industries and was developed by NASA in order to ensure food safety. It is very likely that an efficient food system developed for space flight will be of use to the population on Earth, potentially ameliorating climate change with smart packaging methods and offering dietary alternatives. Um, it could even ameliorate world hunger by providing foods of high nutritional value. So, where do we go now? In case you didn't notice, in the first part, my choice of words was very careful. Uh, perhaps vitamin K needs to be incorporated, astronauts might have increased needs in antioxidants, and the choice of words was made because we are not sure yet, and there are many things that are yet to be tested. Nutrition in space is a still emerging field, and I'm convinced there is important work to be done. The longer a mission lasts, the higher is the likelihood of performance decrement and crew illness uh, due to inadequate food and nutrition, and the heavier the consequences will be. So more data should be collected, and that should be performed in a manner that allows the development of research databases and of consistent systematic research plans. 
This will facilitate communication of information and will set a path for future researchers, allowing the impact of nutrition on human space travel to grow. Our ability to prepare better for future challenges and to develop preventive strategies will grow. And most importantly, nutrition scientists will be able to contribute to the development of an effective and sustainable space health system, whose benefits will not be limited to space travelers. That's all for me. Thank you very much. Excellent. Thank you, Christina. This is a, a great overview of uh, space nutrition, their impact on the health of astronaut and uh, some of the challenges we are currently dealing with. Thanks for that. You certainly uh, put space food in a new perspective. I'm sure there will be lots of questions about this uh, that we will save for the end. Uh, in the meantime, you can put them in the chat box if, you, if questions uh, come up. Um, because first, we will be switching to the United States now, to Benjamin Greaves. Hi, Benjamin. Thanks for being with us uh, as well today. Um, Thanks so much I'll, for having me. I'll make you presenter. Ben and I were classmates uh, at the International Space University uh, last uh, summer, uh, where I heard uh, about some of his work already, which is very exciting. So I'll, um, I'm looking forward to, uh, to your presentation. and. Hope to hear some of your experiences during the uh, high seas, and I already see it. So um, the floor is yours, uh, Benjamin. Great, thanks so much. And uh, the presentation you just heard by Christina is such a great overview. I was actually writing down a couple of notes because a lot of them are, are quite applicable um, to what I'm going to talk about here in my uh, in my talk. Um, so. Uh, as, as Christina kind of gave the overview, um, I thought I'd give more of a um, individual example of how a lot of the things that she mentioned um, that we're, we're actually currently working on on Earth. Um, so this is a picture of the uh, High Seas Habitat, which stands for Hawaii Space Exploration Analog and Simulation. Um, so as you can see, um, this will play into a little bit later, but uh, we have some solar panels there. Um, and so it it's uh, completely solar powered, um, everything that we do there. Um, and so that's going to uh, play into a lot in terms of the energy use that is required um, with, with making food. Um, and so this was a great photo uh, by our um, crew operations uh, engineer, Fabio Teixeira. Um, so kind of getting more into what High Seas is and why it is, um, it's on the big island of Hawaii. Um, at 8,200 feet or 2,500 meters for those of you in Europe. Um, so that actually does play a factor slightly um, when you're doing, uh, we have required 30 minute workouts every day um, to simulate that um, exercise that you would have on the International Space Station. I mean, you can feel it just a little bit, not too much, but um, it does uh, play a factor in kind of your overall health during the mission. Um, I uh, took part in a two week mission. Um, but they have done uh, missions all the way up to one year um, in the past. Uh, Dr. Musilova is currently serving as the director, um, and I think they just started a, a new crew uh, just recently. Um, and some rules in terms of the food and drink is that no um, crew member is allowed to bring their own food or drink. Everything is provided um, by the uh, by the high seas itself. Um, and while I guess I don't know uh, if we would have been told, um, we we weren't aware of it. We, we might have been able to be told if we asked about it, but I had gone into this not knowing uh, what the food was actually going to be. Um, NICE nice serves as a variety of the many different astronaut analogs that we have here on Earth um, under various space agencies and various actually private stuff as well. Um, and so all of them have their different focuses and have their different levels of um, uh, how accurate they would be to those maybe on Mars or the moon. Um, ours was uh, a mission about uh, being on the moon though. So motivation for the research about the nutrition um, I, is I wanted to build off of High Seas One. Um, and if you haven't heard about that first mission, um, Dr. Cyan Proctor uh, has a great spinoff from the research that they did there um, at mealsformars.com where she actually developed a cookbook of some of the work that they did there. Um, but the thing that I wanted to kind of differ from them was their mission was very much focused on food. Um, and so part of it made it almost unrealistic to the point that um, obviously when we have Martian or lunar missions, um, that's not going to be the key focus. We're going to have science, we're going to have exploration, um, and we're not going to be able to spend um, so much time studying 
um, our, our diets and our foods, um, but they still had an incredible amount of, um, of findings from that mission. Um, and so I kind of just wanted to take a look at what happens when you have nutrition when it's not the main focus of uh, the overall mission. Um, I also wanted to uh, look at uh, crop selection um, from a different perspective. Uh, those of us in the plant growth uh, sector oftentimes uh, have the plants be the forefront and, and we'll select all the plants that we want to grow. Um, and then at the end, we'll fill in the gaps with um, whether it be supplements or, or um, pre-supplied missions. So I actually wanted to kind of start from the other side and see what are some of the pre-supplied food that we'd be given and then kind of what can we, um, what plant should we grow to fill the nutrient gaps that are left? Um, and so high seas, um, it, it does uh, change. And, and I'm, I'm absolutely not saying that uh, everything that we have at high seas is going to be what we have on Mars or the moon or in space. Um, but I do believe that they, that they purchase the food. Everything is freeze dried or in powdered form. Um, and there is some sense of um, accuracy when it comes to uh, the uh, type of food that they're going to have and, and moving forward. Um, next, I wanted to increase food accuracy of these astronaut analogs. As I just talked about, um, it is something that they work towards. They do try to keep up that simulation and making sure that we are eating food um, that you would have in space. We actually did have uh, some astronaut ice cream that no one enjoyed because um, those are really gross. Um, but, you know, they, they are trying to make that um, something that's uh, accurate for what we're going to have in the future. Um, and so while this wasn't the core uh, thing that I that I looked into further ahead, I do hope that this starts as a conversation point for, for moving forward. Um, throughout the mission, I also found what the importance of good food. Um, that became so apparent uh, through our, just our 14 days there. I'm going to put good in quotes because it can take a different... Uh, perspective. You can have good as in tasty. Uh, you can have good as in uh, nutritious. You can have good as as visually um, and 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 smelling good as well. Um, and so all those things, um, as Christina mentioned, take into account that um, that tasty meal has such a great psychological impact. Um, and and you know sometimes on our rainy days, uh, that was very obvious. We actually celebrated Thanksgiving. Uh, during the mission, um, and that was actually one of our, our more fun days. Um, and then finally, my main research that I was doing there was plant growth. Um, and you know, after you plant the seeds and water them, they're kind of on autopilot. So I had some time to kill. Um, so I thought this would be a good use of that time. Um, so going back to kind of that psychological uh, impact, um, this was a uh, the first time that I saw that we were going to have coffee uh, during this mission, captured by our crew journalist, uh, Cassie Kloss. Um, and so you can see that optimism and that knowledge that we're going to be OK uh, when I when I knew that we were going to be able to have some coffee. Um, and so that is, um, you know, we talk a lot about nutrition. We talk a lot about vitamins, and minerals. Um, but that that comfort, that comfort food, that uh, that reminder of home um, is so, so um, important um, and you know whether that be food or drink um, can really make or break a mission. In addition to that, um, I think uh, something that I found very important was the kitchen. So here is me um, in my jacket because it was very cold and my ISU bandana um, uh, making some mac and cheese, I think. Um, and so one thing that I noticed is that um, while there was, you know, while we did eventually get sick of all the freeze dried food and all the powder, um, the kitchen was very well stocked. And I think that's very important and something that I want to make sure that we don't forget about in terms of habitat development is, you know, um, if you have a well stocked, roomy kitchen, um, your chefs will enjoy being there. Um, as well as, you know, if you have people that aren't natural chefs and are trying to learn, they might have a little bit easier of a time um, if it isn't so uh, cramped. Um, and so that's something that, um, you know, some of our, our best times was, was trying to work with the almond flour that we had making cookies. I totally burnt them in the oven. Um, but, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a place that you have to cook three meals a day. Um, you know, that could be dispersed amongst the crew members, but um, it is a very important space um, and just totally outside the food itself. Uh, the, the, the kitchen itself is, is such an important aspect. Um, and this was captured by Dr. Musilova. 
So let's get to the brass tacks. This is what I found. Um, so you can see there uh, we have our macros um, on the far left. We have our minerals in the middle and we have our vitamins on the far right. Um, in uh, Within each one on the left, I have everything from food and on the right, I have everything from the supplements. Um, everything that's in dark red is um, stuff that, you know, quote unquote, bad stuff uh, that we got more than 100% of. Um, and everything in green is the good stuff uh, that we got at least 100% of. Um, and so kind of going through how I decided to make this database is I took one serving size of every um, item in the every edible item in the kitchen other than spices and seasonings. Obviously, you're not going to be having one serving of everything, but I thought this was the best way to kind of get an overall picture of what's available in the habitat to eat. Um, and, uh, you know, if you're counting one serving size of everything that's available and you're still not hitting 100% um, in a lot of these vitamin Bs, um, you can tell that that's a gap. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to start from the top that um, this wouldn't be accurate in terms of what you'd get on a daily basis, uh, but just given an idea of what we had available to us. Um, as I mentioned, food provided uh, to the crew uh, isn't uh, known before you go, um, and it does vary slightly mission to mission. Um, a lot of items, they, they do just replace um, the exact same thing, um, but there is sometimes some variety, um, as Dr. Musilova uh, does the these missions back to back, um, she definitely needs to make sure that there's some variety. Um, but um, I have been assured that this is kind of the general gist of, of the nutrient values that they have. Um, the only difference would be, you know, um, whether or not you get uh, freeze dried strawberries versus freeze dried raspberries versus, you know, freeze dried um, spinach versus freeze dried uh, lettuce. I don't know if that's a thing. Um, obviously, the theme is everything's freeze dried. Um, and then finally, uh, for this information, um, it was first sourced from the package itself, um, but then a lot of times certain brands uh, will not list some of these more lesser known um, items on their nutrition label. And so I would go to the USDA's Food Data Central um, for this. Um, so I have um, a, a full list and some supplemental slides if you have specific questions um, on this. Um, but I do want to kind of move forward in terms of what sorts of food that you're able to uh, might be able to fill these gaps. Um, so I really focused on these vitamin Bs um, as I am biased and I do uh, enjoy vegetables. And that's often the source of a lot of these vitamin Bs. Um, and so just going down the list, um, keep in mind that there are obviously uh, different um, amounts, uh, uh, difficulties with some of these. For example, the white button mushrooms, they only provide that vitamin D D2 if grown under UV light. Um, so, you know, it's possible, but, you know, it is an, an added engineering requirement. Um, so, yeah, so those white button mushrooms, um, as, as uh, Christina mentioned, we don't have that, we don't have the uh, ability to get uh, solar uh, vitamin D, um, which is uh, vitamin D3, uh, when we're on the ISS. We really won't get it when we're on Mars um, or the moon. And so you need to find a way to get that through food or through supplements. Um, and so obviously you can see through the supplements, we were able to achieve that. And we did have a specific vitamin D specific supplement if you wanted. Um, but with a lot of these nutrients, um, a, a lot of times they break down a little bit easier um, if you get them from a natural food source rather than the supplement. Um, and, and in addition, those supplements can often, um, if spent enough time in space, as Christina mentioned, those, those nutrients can break down. Um, spinach or kale, uh, kale is, you know, very well known as kind of that power, super, super vegetable. Um, and that's absolutely true. Um, I don't know if they named vitamin K after kale because you could truly get almost your entire vitamin K through like a leaf of kale. Um, it's truly like 500% um, of your daily requirement for one serving size of kale. Um, so kale and spinach, um, they, they are benefit because they're also that pick and eat. You can, you can grow them very easily. You can eat them right off the, um, the branch. It's not entirely accurate terminology, but basically um, you don't have to post-process post like you would for some of these others. Sunflower seeds obviously have their growth problems. They are very tall. They have a lot of inedible plant biomass. 
Um, but um, a lot of things are, are possible with them. They're a very versatile plant. You can actually have some of the uh, petals um, are often um, can be used as almost a garnish for some salads. Um, and then the seeds you can press into an oil. And this kind of goes back to that dietary diversity. How do you, um, yeah, some people don't like kale. I understand that. Um, how do you eat those sunflower seeds? I'm, I'm personally a huge fan of like salted seeds, um, but they are a huge source of uh, vitamin E um, and, and a group of those vitamin Bs as well. Cauliflower, uh, I put up on there specifically for their biotin or B7. Um, they're a great source of that. Um, and that's oftentimes a tough um, uh, nutrient to get in space because it's often provided by um, animal products, um, which unless we have cellular ag, I'm actually not sure if that, that properly grows biotin, um, it will be difficult to get. Um, also, you know, a great source of vitamin C um, and vitamin K. Um, as we know, those two are, are quite important. Um, and then finally, soybeans, um, great source of phosphorus. Um, and those B2 and B9s, as you can see, um, are, are very lacking. Um, and, and that vitamin K as well. So, um, yeah, I know these are very, you might have very pointed questions at, at some of these numbers. And I, I hope to be able to, you can, you can message me um, about some of these specifics later. Um, some other considerations that I found, and I'll let this uh, video run. Um, this is a video of me trying to cook um, on low power, and I, I muted it just so I can talk over it. But um, really the idea of um, you're going to have these low power days. Because we were um, solar powered, um, you would have days where, you know, you wouldn't be able to go on an EVA because it'd be cloudy or raining, um, and you wouldn't be able to watch TV, um, or you'd have to lower the temperature. I would say that was probably the, the hardest part to endure is we lowered it by about three degrees Celsius. Um, and so we were really just put all of our, our layers of clothes on. Um, and so this is where kind of, do you have leftovers that you cook um, through different meals when you heat them up? Um, and, uh, you know, just having those meals planned that you might be able to eat on low power. Um, oftentimes for us, this ended up being kind of lukewarm oatmeal mixed with some like freeze dried strawberries. Um, so, you know, you can get sick of that pretty quickly. Um, but kind of going back to that psychological benefit of all of this, um, it, it really is um, that that plays a big factor. Um, and then finally, the dietary variety of every meal, whether that be in taste, in culture, cuisine, in nutrition, and then in skill level. Um, so of course, we always want to make sure that we have that variety in taste. We don't want to be eating the same thing, uh, the same tastes every day. Um, we also don't want um, everybody for our first mission on Mars to be from the same culture or from um, all from one continent, all eating the same food. Uh, we want to make sure we have that diversity. Um, and so I'm actually going to ask for your help a little bit later in order to help with that mission. Um, nutrition, we all know why that's important to uh, stay varied. Um, and then skill level, um, especially during some of our uh, uh, analogs, you know, you may have some people that uh, are good at cooking and some people that think they're good at cooking and might not be. Um, and, you know, that's always a, uh, you know, something that you got to work with. Um, and so having some meals uh, prepared that allow you to kind of have a varying level of chefs so you don't always putting that on one person the whole time. And, you know, you can have people kind of give different recipes a shot um, is always a, a nice thing. Um, so thank you so much for your time. Um, uh, this was actually a illustration that I had uh, the incredible Sophie Shen uh, draw um, on behalf of this uh, talk that we we're given. Um, and uh, as I mentioned, um, uh, I, I need your help. Um, and so I thought this was a great opportunity to get in touch with people from around the world that are interested in, in food and space. Um, and so if you want to go to uh, tinyurl.com uh, backslash SGAST food, um, there is a quick survey. Um, it's anonymous um, other than like the country you're from, but it's basically uh, a, an idea of trying to understand the cuisines of the world. Um, you know, we don't, um, as an American, I'm very much used to the American diet, um, and I wasn't uh, aware of certain items like cassava um, and kind of how much of that's just one example of a staple until I, I went to Gambia with the Peace Corps. Um, and so I want to continue to 
um, make sure we have all the information from around the world, um, all the different foods, because not only um, does that add uh, culinary diversity, but there can also be some foods out there that are super efficient to grow and are packed with nutrients that maybe um, a lot of people like at NASA or ESA maybe aren't considering it. Um, so if you have any questions, uh, thank you uh, so much for posting that in the chat. If you have any questions on how I can improve, if there's something I'm, I'm missing out on, um, please uh, send me a message um, on Twitter or Instagram because um, I, I always want to keep improving that. Um, Give it to your friends, your family. Uh, we're just trying to get as much information as possible on there. Um, and thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Benjamin. Thanks. Great overview of your uh, of your research work and experiences on board the uh, analog environment at High Seas. I think this was very informative and inspiring for our viewers. So thanks for that. We have been receiving many questions as well for you and for Christina. So this brings us to the Q and A part of our episode. I turn to you, the audience now. Uh, this is your chance to ask uh, everything you want to know about nutrition in space. So feel free to put your questions in the chat box to the right of your screen, and I'll try to uh, to moderate these. And um, I got many questions already. So um, maybe for the both of you, a lot of questions go into, um, for example, the mood boosting effects of certain foods. Um, and how we can supplement them in the form of, of capsules. Are we going to use some types of drugs even for that? Or to, to, to sum it up in one sentence, is there going to be a magic pill for astronauts? Well, Christina. Um, from, yeah, yeah. <laughs> from my perspective, um, I know that those um, um, a research that is happening on uh, in astronauts they are quite costly so we can't really um, try things that are not successful already on earth so everything that um, has been tried there has already been very carefully um, tested um, on, on earth so I think that as long as this is not a priority on earth it's not going to be anytime soon that we are trying uh, pills. We're going to focus on things that we are 100% sure that they're working. And then again, more enjoyable as well, uh, of course, uh, as, as Benjamin clearly uh, showed as well. So <clears throat> a question from Roxy Fournier to, uh, to Benjamin. How much time were you allotted each day for food preparation and eating on board the high, high seas? Yeah, so um, it wasn't necessarily allotted. So um, it was, um, we weren't like keep it in this amount of time. It was just, you know, however much time it takes to cook. Um, so I would say breakfast, um, uh, and that was probably the least amount of variety. We It was very often um, oatmeal. Um, every once in a while we'd splurge and do pancakes. Um, but that was probably the quickest meal to make um, in under a half hour. Um, lunch was probably uh, 45 minutes to an hour. Um, and then um, dinner was probably 45 minutes to an hour. Um, and that was uh, done by people. So we do scientific reports every day. And so if you were finished with that, um, you would often take the shift of cooking. Um, and then we'd all eat together. And that was probably about 30 minutes. All right. And so if we uh, if we um, go back to the um, uh, resupply of food, so if we're not growing it ourselves for current missions or simulations, what does it take to supply the food to space missions or simulations? Are there any restrictions? You mentioned you couldn't get your own food on board. Are there any other restrictions um, for food in space? I can take this one. Um, so. I would say in terms, it, it depends on your destination. So I do believe that the current plan for Artemis um, in terms of lunar exploration is going to be mainly resupply. Um, and the, most of the plant growth work that's going to be done there is going to be um, a stepping stone for Mars, um, as well as kind of understanding how plants develop. Um, I saw a couple of questions in the chat regarding kind of um, genome expression and, and genetic changes. Um, so as we have that radiation in the lunar environment, uh, we're also going to be able to look into that. 
Um, so it'll also be cost. It'll maybe be cost. Um, it, it won't really be worth it to, to grow a full scale greenhouse um, on the lunar surface, but we absolutely probably will um, on Mars. All right. Just um, to add to this. Sure. Oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, no, uh, when we're talking about the spacecraft, we also need to think about uh, the available space, of course, because I, uh, they are not very spacious, so you cannot load all the food you want in there or the um, food production system that would take all this space. Um, so that, that would be one um, limitation. And of course, the power needed. Yes, and this also relates to a question uh, from Alicia that was asking, how do you handle the food or vegetable waste in space? So is post-harvesting and storage, is there any opportunities there? Does anyone have a thought about that? Yeah, I'm a big proponent of um, black soldier flies, um, specifically looking at insect proteins. Um, so in a paper, uh, we had uh, a brilliant plant scientist, uh, Eva Bertel, um, who proposed um, and found this um, uh, idea of a, a very well maintained um, uh, use of black of uh, black soldier flies in in if you feed them with um, food that uh, usually they're used for animal feed for chickens um, and you know that's a little bit more uh, loose on what you feed the black soldier flies um, because there aren't as many food concerns. Um, but if you uh, make sure that you feed them, you know, uh, stalks of, of sunflowers, um, they, uh, they do a very efficient process at, at turning that would be waste into protein. Um, and protein will be kind of that, uh, that tough spot uh, moving forward. Um, so, and it looks like it's, it's expanding. I know Robert Downey Jr. just invested um, in insect, it's, it's spelled not like that, but um, it's it's going out in Europe. Um, they're looking at doing an insect protein powder, so I'm very excited to see um, that uh, taken on um, around the world. Cool, and that's very cool. Uh, Stephanie Wan is adding in the chat that there are Korean recipes uh, answering your question for diversity in the uh, nutrition that have uh, more zero waste dishes. Um, for example, even making a kimchi from the watermelon rinse. So that uh, might be interesting for your questionnaire as well. Um, Christina, are you aware, or maybe Benjamin, have, has there any been has there been an exploration of aquatic farming, like growing seaweed for space as well? Christina, maybe? I am not aware of this. Uh, I don't know about Ben. I, I know a lot of, of work has been done in terms of algae and duckweed um, as they um, are, are a great um, possible source of food. Um, and this is similar to the black soldier flies of, I think we also have to get over um, some of the non-traditional foods that we're used to um, before we really dive into that. Um, but they're, they're very efficient. Um, they're also great for life support systems in terms of, of reducing CO2. Um, and so that's what I, I know best in, in terms of that area of, of things. The food on Earth right. is also evolving. So you're, yeah, we're very likely to see this evolution reflected in space as we're moving to alternative protein sources on Earth. It's definitely going to happen there as well. Yeah, very interesting. And so the content of the food, when creating irradiated food, is the actual food affected in any way? So does it affect the appearance, texture, taste, or the contents as well? Um, I'm not entirely sure <laughs> about this one. Um, but yeah, it's, it's basically just a way to um, uh, to sterilize it. So we can think of pasteurized milk, for example. So I suppose the effects are not very uh, prominent on the texture or the taste. All right. And yeah. um, some questions appearing in the chat as well, but are there any safety risks to growing algae on the International Space Station or any future spacecraft as well? Has there been some concerns for that? Yeah, um, so I uh, 
if, if you are interested in that, I would check out the work of Dr. Emily Matula. She's currently at NASA Johnson, um, and she did some incredible work on that in terms of incorporating algae um, not only into the uh, life support systems, but also in terms of heat exchangers um, and, and how well they were at um, dispersing heat, if I remember correctly. Um, so I think that's uh, some really exciting work. Um, but yeah, obviously, anytime you have um, uh, a life anywhere, uh, you got to make sure that it doesn't, uh, you know, get out of control. So yes, there will be some risks. And make some science fiction horror movie uh, stuff ready. So uh, I think I read something about 3D printing foods for space as well. Do you have any experience with that? And what will it mean for those long-term missions, you think? Christina, do you, uh, you want to take this? Yeah, it, it is a very interesting uh, um, possibility, I think. Like, there's a lot of um, ways to experiment with this. But as I said before, I think it first needs to be um, tested on Earth thoroughly before it is implemented in space missions. And um, yeah, I think there are already a lot of initiatives uh, regarding uh, 3D printing of food on Earth. Um, so yeah, I wouldn't exclude it. It's it's very likely, and it can offer, in my opinion, a lot of uh, potential uh, because, of course, um, uh, the first materials might be the same, but if you suppose that you can feed it with different spices, um, different flavors might come out. So the final product might be not exactly the same, but it can offer some variety to the taste buds of astronauts. Hmm. And before we know it, uh, we have a replicator, a Star Trek replicator on board our uh, future spacecraft. That would be a thing. Uh, so I have a, uh, maybe, I think, a last question for both speakers. Um, so what advice do you have for someone interested in doing research in this field of space health about space nutrition and space foods? Um, Christina, you want to go ahead? Yeah, I, my advice would be just be as um, as determined and annoying as possible. When you find someone who has written an article that's of interest to you, just ask, email, let everyone know. And at some point you will see the opportunity, but just communicate your will to contribute to this. And eventually you will meet the right people. Excellent. And Benjamin, do you have something to add to that? Yeah, I think um, this is going to be an incredible um, uh, sector that is, is there's still so many jobs that haven't even been created yet, um, both in terms of space exploration as well as work here on Earth. Um, and so I think a lot of these, um, if you're looking to get into this, a lot of there are a lot of opportunities with uh, vertical farming, permaculture. Um, there's there's a whole bunch of different ways to get into this because we're going to need all hands on deck. Um, so, you know, I've found, you know, even just continuing to, to have a home garden or, you know, maybe even taking it a step further and having more or less a controlled environment where you might uh, have your own light uh, or have your own even CO2 source um, and a, maybe a fan. Um, I think a lot of that hands on work um, goes a long way. You don't really need to, you know, have a PhD in it to, uh, to learn a lot about some of this work. Right. Great, thanks. Thanks for sharing uh, both your advice. Um, we are at the top of the hour, which means that we have to conclude this seventh episode of the Health in Space series. Uh, I'd like to give many thanks to our speakers, Christina Velakuti and Benjamin Greaves, for being with us today. Um, if you would like to know more about space nutrition, feel free to reach out to them. Both have shared their contact details uh, here. Um, and also the uh, SGSA subgroup on space nutrition that Christina is leading is welcoming interested people to interact. Uh, but for now, the presentations that you gave us were fantastic and they gave us a broad understanding of the field of space nutrition, food for space, um, and also food for thought, essential for the next steps of human space travel. So thanks a lot for taking the time, both of you. Um, to you, the audience, if you liked this episode, check out the SGAC YouTube channel for more previous episodes and other material, and feel free to share them on our on social media using the um, his chat, health in space chat hashtag shown earlier, 
Uh, also, you could use this hashtag to keep the conversation going or follow along, looking for more inspiration. And as for the Health in Space series, this was our seventh episode, but we are evaluating new topics for new episodes. We have a whole list of fascinating topics that come to mind when thinking about health in space. But if you have a topic that you are passionate about or want to learn more about, find me on LinkedIn or Twitter and let me know. We'd like to create this series together with you, our audience. That was it for today. Thank you again, Christina Valakuti, Benjamin Greaves, and thanks everyone that joined us from around the globe. Have a great day ahead and see you next time. Thanks.